I'm Jennifer Schenker, uh, editor-in-chief of The Innovator, uh, a Paris-based uh, magazine about uh, digital transformation. Um, the audience can follow the discussion on social media um, at, at AMNC19. Um, we're here this morning to talk about racing towards uh, electric mobility, and uh, we will leave about 15 minutes at the end of the uh, discussion for uh, questions for the audience. So please uh, be thinking about what you would like to uh, ask our panelists. Um, I am very pleased uh, to have with us here this morning um, Governor Uchibadi from um, uh, Fukushima, Japan, um, who will be speaking in uh, Japanese, uh, Francois Provost, who is uh, the chairman of Group Renault in China. Um, we have um, uh, uh, Zheng uh, Lei, who is uh, the uh, CEO of Envision Group, uh, Charlotte Rule, uh, the CEO of NG Group in China, and uh, Shen Hu, uh, who is um, the um, uh, founder of Wu Motor, a uh, electric vehicle startup here in um, China. Uh, so just to set the scene here, um, a new report by uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, predicts that uh, electric vehicles will make up 57% of global passenger car sales by 2040, with electric buses dominating the sector, representing 81% of municipal bus sales by the same date. And electric vehicles are expected to re represent 56% of light commercial, commercial vehicle sales, uh, such as vans and light trucks in Europe, the US, and China within the next two decades. The escalation of electric vehicles is ex expected to add 6.8% to global electricity consumption by 2040 and to drive demand for lithium ion batteries, which could lead to a supply crunch. These developments are expected to have a big impact on the auto industry, the energy sector, the battery sector, and they are leading to the addition of uh, many new market entrants, such as Tesla and companies like WM Motor. Now, um, the road ahead is anything but smooth. China is at the forefront of electric vehicles, but even in this country, um, not all of the new venture-backed uh, new market entrants in electric vehicles are doing well, and the government has just cut subsidies in half. In Europe, the German government is spending uh, a billion euros to try to um, encourage consumers to buy electric vehicles, but a uh, board member of uh, BMW uh, has just made headlines saying that he believes that electric vehicles are overhyped. And he said, I quote, from what we see, all electric uh, vehicles are great for China and for California, but everyone else is better off with plug-in hybrids. How do, do the panelists agree with that um, conclusion? And how do you each see the market evolving? What do you see as the, uh, as the challenges? Um, perhaps uh, we will start uh, with you, Shen. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, my name is Freeman. Um, this is oh, my sorry, Chinese sorry, name, sorry. Sun Wei, <laughs> and uh, I don't know why they put this here, so people don't. Um, I came from WM Motors. Um, Chinese name is Wei Ma Qi Ce. Um, uh, actually, the, uh, the market, uh, electric, electric market, the electric car market in China is still going very well. Uh, we have to consider the, the overall market condition in China these days. You know, the economy start, start slowing down, and uh, as a matter of fact, the um, uh, ICE car, the internal combustion engine car, in the passenger sector has been uh, reducing very significantly this year. Uh, in that um, overall market con uh, situation, the electric vehicle sales still going up. First quarter actually is over 50% growth versus the same period last year. Um, on the other hand, when the government actually 
uh, reduced the subsidy significantly this year. Uh, typically, when government cancel or reduce some kind of policy, there's two main reasons. One, they think it's wrong. Uh, obviously, it's not, because the government thing, electric vehicle is the future of China. Um, the NDRC, which is the most powerful Chinese central government department, uh, issue a, a notice to the uh, local government that uh, nobody should allow to put the limits on the electric vehicles. They call it two limits. The first, cancel the limits of the uh, usage of the electric vehicle. The secondary, cancel the limits on the license plates for electric vehicles. So in that sense, the government think electric vehicle is the right policy, it's the right direction. So that's not the first reason. The second reason is this industry has been growing too quick, become maturing, so the government should not provide a subsidy anymore. Uh, Chinese government putting like a 30 billion RMB a year to support electric vehicles. Now it's going too quickly, it's out of this budget. So they have to reduce that because the, we, are, we sold about 1.2 million electric vehicle last year. This year, this year easily can go 1.5 million or more. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they cannot afford that anymore. So to us, it's good news. At, actually, it is a good news for those companies who can provide good products. In the past, if you look in the electric vehicle market in China, most of them um, was poorly engineering, very poor design, and the people buy it simply because the license plates and subsidies. Now the subsidy is gone, and the people need to really look at the product. The consumer need to understand if the product is good enough for them, not just because the subsidies. So I think it's good news for WM Motors because we are focused on product. We are not focused just putting a car on the road. Okay. Uh, Mr. Polos, do you see a difference in the way the market for electric vehicles is uh, evolving in China as opposed to Europe? Um, in, in China, the, the strong uh, support of the government and a comprehensive policy, uh, both on the uh, regulation side, uh, Chinese regulation is the uh, most severe in the world. There is uh, what we call cap C, so the average uh, uh, emission per car, uh, plus uh, percentage of the production should be EV. Uh, so all of this push a lot for, for EVs on one side, but also a strong policy uh, towards uh, charging infra, mm -hmm. more than uh, 5 million uh, charging points by 2022, uh, uh, and also uh, restriction, either plate limitation or access to the downtown. So in China, it's probably the, the biggest country and the most comprehensive policy to, met, uh, to make uh, EV ramp up uh, very quick. Uh, again, once again, subsidies for, for the product, uh, charging infra and uh, limitation uh, uh, of uh, access to, to, to downtown. All of this, uh, for sure, creates a strong move to EV, and I agree with you, uh, we are keeping on Renault side very much optimistic about the evolution of the electric car market, and also, uh, as uh, um, for the automakers capable to do uh, very good products and also affordable products without subsidies, for sure the growth is, is, will be very big in China. Okay, great. So let's look now at um, how uh, the view from the energy sector. Um, so uh, let's start with you, Charlotte. So actually, I would concur with you. Um, the market in China is still evolving positively, so to, with you both. But when you were saying this is a good news, uh, I would concur even more. Uh, it's not only about uh, electrical mobility, it's about climate change. How do we have an impact on that? And I think that has been very well understood. So now what we see in terms of challenges, so we as NG in China, we are involved in EV charging. That's a natural place for energy players. And the question is, how do we manage this increased electrical mobility on the grid itself? So there are a number of, uh, of actions that we can take, and we definitely need to work with the grid. We also, I mean, optimize our system in order to be... Uh, uh, to, to make them more resilient towards the grid. And I think that's definitely one of the challenges. When you look at electrical mobility, uh, you have two inflection points. So it's increasing and it's increasing again and again until it is uh, at parity. Uh, so it is already affordable in China. And then there is a moment where it will decrease because the infrastructure growth is slowing down. So for the moment, th there is still a question of EV charging, having enough EV charging, having place where to park simply. Uh, that's, uh, that's the main issue, but it allows us to rethink completely the city in a more sustainable way. 
Okay, and let's have the view from Envision. Um, you quote someone mentioned, so EV still a hype of a government. I um, totally disagree. And we should look at the EV movement from the overall energy transition perspective. Today, it's not about the immobility. It's about emission, carbon pricing, climate change, climate risk. So in order to achieve Paris Agreement, so we have to cut emission from mobility sector. And the global oil demand, 60 to 70 percent, is coming from mobility sector. So we have to deeply electrify mobility. And today, we are at the right time. So almost the EV life cycle cost is close to the gasoline car. Mm -hmm. And what's most important thing, if we look at what is still preventing the large adoption of EV, it's actually the big elephant is a battery. Why people not buying EV? Still too expensive. Battery is 50% powertrain, is a 50% of the car. At the same time, it's difficult to find charging place. Sometimes some people are worrying about the safety. Battery got burned. Some people get a mileage anxiety. It's not long enough. Today, the only big difference is the battery technology. Mm -hmm. So, but if we look at 2010, the cost of a battery is 1,000 US dollar per kilo hour. By 2020, <laughs> will be around 100 US dollar per kilo hour. It's 10% compared with 10 years ago. If we look at dynamically for next five years, by 2025, envision we are a leading battery manufacturer as well. We foresee we are able to achieve 50 US dollar by 2025. Then, this is totally to make EV so cost competitive. And envision we have a seminar a few weeks ago when we talked to the senior executive from Volkswagen. They said they are working on the last generation of diesel engine. And, and uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Vatican with all the oil CEOs. They are also embracing the carbon pricing. So now, movement for the electric mobility is not about responsibility. Also, it's about humanity needs, not the needs of government. It's needs for everyone. Very good. So let, let's now get the view from Japan. So to give us a, a view of how um, electric vehicles are evolving um, in your country. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, the, I agree uh, to the, the comments made by the previous speakers. In 2011, as you know, the Great East earthquake took place, and also there was a d nuclear disaster. And as a result, the Fukushima prefecture was uh, uh, affected. Over the last eight years, we have received the warm support from the people all over the world. And therefore, reconstruction of the Fukushima has been progressing very smoothly. But on the other hand, the disaster caused by the nuclear power plant has been given a lot of uh, the, the impacts. And even after eight years, reconstruction of the Fukushima has not been completed yet. So we really have to fight a long war uh, from now. So from that perspective, Fukushima Prefecture and Japan, we really have to uh, the push the renewable energy. We do need to have a rapid increase of the renewable energy. And so in that respect, the position and role to be played by EV is even greater. And from now, the, in order to maintain the sustainable development in the world, renewable energy and EV. We really need to have the very high positioning of those two uh, the categories. And 
in doing so in Fukushima Prefecture, where I come from, uh, the the EV. I just uh, talk about examples later. But in different reg the regions, we try to make active use of EV. And for instance, in the disaster affected area, an area which is affected by nuclear, uh, the the plant disaster, and they were evac evacuated. But now the people start coming back to those uh, the area. How we are able to use EV there, and also all across. Japan. Uh, Japan is an uh, aging society, and also we have a very low fertility rate, and so declining population. So with aging of the people and the lower fertility, how we are able to use EV? Uh, society has a need. So in Fukushima Prefecture and all across Japan, we now uh, the define EV as a very important tool to solve many problems. Uh, Governor, so now that we have established um, the, um, the strong incentive to move to electric vehicles um, for climate change, um, for humanity, as you said, um, obviously gov governments have a, uh, a strong um, desire to make this move. Um, but how do we convince uh, the public uh, and what will it take for the traditional auto manufacturers to make the complete transition away from diesel engines to electric vehicles in terms of their adjusting their production plants and what is the timetable and what are some of the challenges that a group like Renault is facing? Yes, uh, actually, uh, for, for Renault and uh, for, uh, for the Alliance, we, we, we started uh, uh, almost 10 years ago, and at this time, by the way, uh, uh, a lot of people say that it, it will never happen, and we were the first one to move, so now we um, already adjusted uh, our uh, R&D and uh, uh, manufacturing as well. The, the biggest uh, move is uh, on, on manufacturing side, supplier side, to move from a traditional ICE uh, to uh, electric. Uh, so this uh, is ongoing, it is not so uh, difficult. The, the big challenge for us uh, is um, about the cost, and especially, as it was said, the cost of the battery, because with the decrease of subsidies, for instance, in China, this year, uh, subsidies decreased by uh, uh, more than 60%, so we have to adjust ourselves with our supplier to, to on, on the cost side. Uh, for on, on customer side, uh, customers are getting more and more use about EVs uh, through uh, um, taxi, car sharing solutions, so they, they, know, they know better. And for me, we already passed the tipping point uh, for which now uh, customers in China, in Europe as well, uh, are ready uh, to buy and to have a car, an electric car. And by the way, among all our lineup, uh, the highest level of satisfaction uh, for our products is from for, for the EV vehicle. And EV customer, once they try EVs, they definitely want to keep EV uh, in, uh, in the future. How do you see competition evolving with new entrants like Tesla or companies like WM Motor? Yes, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a good uh, push to us. Uh, and uh, not so in terms of product and technology, but more uh, a global approach of the, uh, uh, the, the mobility, connectivity, and uh, interference between uh, driver, passengers, and the car. And companies uh, uh, like WM and others are thinking the car uh, globally in terms of system. And this is something a little bit new for us. And, and, and we, are, uh, we are catching up, and especially in China, where connectivity is in advance compared to the rest of the world. So I, I, I'm very happy to have the, the, this type of new competition because, because this will, at the end, boom up uh, the electric mobility. Freeman, how, um, what are the challenges of new entrants in ramping up and achieving scale? Uh, because this is, this is not uh, you know, an internet play, even though you're backed by Tencent and Baidu, you, you have to produce physical products and uh, expensive ones of that. Well, um, we have obviously a lot of challenges. In the past few years, our focus is always 
uh, on the product itself. You know, uh, we're putting over 1,000 engineers have been working on the, the product for almost four years. Um, this is, uh, even for a traditional car company, it's not so easy. I know uh, I worked for a traditional car company for over 15 years. I know um, they're very strong. But on the other hand, there's too many things on the plate. Um, for me, I'm only one thing, put the electric vehicle, uh, uh, smart uh, electric vehicle on the, on the market. So we are a very small company, but we put a thousand people engineer on that. The challenge would be the brand awareness. It's very low. Uh, not, not many people know what, who we are. You know, uh, and uh, um, another very big challenge would be um, the, the channels. You know, uh, 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 in the internet business in China, people are always talking about online, how to spread the brand, let the people uh, place the order. But eventually, for the business we are in, you need to have the offline store to deliver the product, to service the people. And then uh, we have uh, already uh, in 30 cities, um, we, another, three year, uh, another three months, we're probably in uh, 50 cities in China, but it's still too little. For a traditional car company, easily you've got 1,000 stores to cover the whole China. So uh, it is a, a very challenge for us to ramp up the, uh, the channel to service the people. Um, luckily, uh, my team had been uh, in the industry for long enough, so we have been able to um, uh, motivate the uh, supply chain working with us. I think the, uh, the, our competition, the, uh, the other newcomer, I think they are facing even more challenge because of supply chain. You know, uh, our business always need to uh, get the value chain working for you, not only in China, but globally. It doesn't matter what kind of car you build, you have to have the uh, partners from US, from uh, Europe from uh, Japan to work with us. Um, if you don't have any experience in this industry, it's very difficult because you're talking about a lot of people, a lot of different uh, partners, different technologies, different countries, uh, how you can make them come to work for you. We are talking about 700 kind of companies <laughs> to build a car. This is extremely challenge. So far, we are fine on that uh, because we have a lot of experience in the, in the traditional car companies. So. Thank you. So now let's let's look um, ag again at how electric vehicles will impact the energy sector. So there's discussion. I mean, beyond just charging the cars, um, what will the impact be on the grid? Do you see, uh, for example, fleet um, fleets of electric cars helping uh, to to balance the grid? Um, and how are you um, adjusting your business and planning for that kind of a future? Uh, uh, we certainly have similar experience, but uh, <clears throat> the way we approach uh, EV charging is definitely to consider it uh, from a holistic perspective, including the grid, but uh, most of all including, as I mentioned just before, climate change. So uh, the point when you start EV charging and you are saying you are doing clean energy is, well, okay, that's fine, but there's a battery. But first, in China, there is the electricity itself, which is still quite carbonized, but there is the battery. So we work on second life battery, how to reuse them, how to reuse them linked with a uh, renewable system, by the way, and bundle of batteries. The idea there is to be able to um, pick shave and, uh, and be more resilient towards the grid. Ideally, and that's the trend, uh, at the end, the idea will be also to put back some power on the green. So we go to the extreme of the smart grid, if you like. Uh, but we are not there yet. Uh, there are some regulation issues also that, uh, that need to be tackled, certainly. But the system can be, in the end, very, um, I mean, very positive. Uh, what we do also, and that we can do it already, is coupled this, obviously, with renewable, but for the charging itself. So, uh, so, so there is a number of things that you can do, starting from there, using this power, which is, by the way, more and more shared. We, we didn't touch that much on that, but that's also a tendency we observe, because actually, in the end, we are getting a bit more competent on the automotive sector, although it's not our sector. But uh, there is this tendency of going for sharing, uh, and so typically Didi is, a, is an interesting company for us uh, in that kind of uh, respect. Uh, but yeah, we go for all that kind of usage from first life battery optimization of it, second life, bundle, renewable. What is Envision's point of view on, on this? Um, first thing I would uh, like add one number so you mentioned, so when the EV fully adopt is going to 7% of new electricity add-on, but one number, if at the same time, the capacity 
could be five times to 10 times. So energy demand, the energy capacity, they are a bit different. So we calculate. So if a max city, 10% to 20% cars have been tra transferred to EV, then your distribution and the gen generation capacity need at least double. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge impact yeah. to the energy system. So from my point of view, we have to put the e-mobility into a large background of energy system. For envision point of view, we see the future is changing is from generation side. We see wind and the renewable, solar is become new coal. So envision is also a leading wind turbine technology company. We are now seeing in China from 2019 onwards, wind energy is going to be fully grid parity and even lower in for next few years. Solar is almost there. So then this is going to replace large amount of coal for generation. So renewable energy is new coal. At the same time, we think battery is new oil. Battery is replacing the oil tank. And also, but you see, the energy system become very interesting. From demand side, renewable, random, intermittent, and very distributed. On the, uh, on the supply side, on the demand side, battery, random as well. Random charging behavior, fragmented as well. So this new energy system is going to be shaped. So then, you know what? You need a new grid system. The new grid system is about the physical grid. The physical grid is about, think about the nature of physical grid, is about connectivity and balancing. Firstly, you connect physical things. Secondly, you balancing supply and demand. What you need is the IoT operating system to connect these billions wind turbines, solar panels, charging stations, storage, HVAC, EVs, at the same time using AI and machine learning technology to real-time balancing such a complex system. Then, you know, you're not only going to harvest low cost of energy from renewable, and at the same time, your current infrastructure, infrastructure is not going to be in a great risk. So do you agree with that point of view? And are, you know, is NG ready for that? If what's the timeline on, on preparing for such great change in your basic infrastructure? Um, well, the, the timeline depends very much on the grid itself. Huh? Uh, it needs to be prepared for that. And depending on the countries, you will have different uh, habits and different uh, ways of forecasting or over the next five years to come, year to come, day ahead, etc. Uh, I fully concur with the idea of uh, making a more direct link between supply and demand. And actually, uh, this is something definitely we push in terms of uh, consumers, uh, notably in China, to have them, I mean, they are asking for more renewable power, but so far, unless we do on-site solution, we cannot really contract with them. Uh, so we have to do virtual products, that kind of thing. Um, I was um, a bit... Um, more doubtful about AI. So I think it's a great idea and it makes fully sense to optimize the whole system. One thing that uh, I'm less convinced is that you still need to orient the need, meaning that uh, at some point you are putting together, uh, I would say HVAC, that kind of thing. I mean, sort of uh, normal uh, uses that don't change really much over time with EV charging, where at some point you will have a customer saying, well, I want to charge right now. So there might be something to do, and that's why actually we are also working on that kind of system that would be more res resilient and that would potentially store electricity or whatever to make sure that at the moment the consumer wants to charge, and this goes also, by the way, with fast charging, he or she can uh, actually charge. It can go very quickly uh, to answer more or less your question, uh, because uh, at the end of the day, what we see in China in particular is that, I mean, the the change were huge and very quick. Uh, I agree with you that in terms of sales of EV, it will go on progressing. So we were at 1 million, and I think we would be even above 1.5 uh, million for this year. So let's see. At some point, uh, 
we need to have a, a sort of action with the grid to see what we can do uh, in order to have a system that is more fluid. Uh, that's what we are looking for. So I think that's a great segue to ask the governor um, a question. We, um, we've talked about the changes that need to happen to the um, energy grid itself. We've talked about the necessity of having um, the right capacity in terms of charging vehicles in big cities, but what about rural areas? How do we make sure that the rollout of electric vehicles is not limited just to big cities, but also um, in, in, in uh, other areas of the country? So I'll ask you that. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, first of all, I first of all would like to utilize also the viewpoints uh, mentioned by other uh, panelists, and I would like to share with you the three ongoing initiatives in Fukushima Prefecture. One of them is the car sharing. As I said, in Fukushima we had a nuclear power plant accident, and uh, and when the evacuation instruction uh, uh, is lifted, uh, the resident will be able to go back to their hometowns. However, the public transformation infrastructures will not be recovered immediately. So in order to uh, cope with that, uh, the car sharing services and uh, capitalizing all electric vehicles is um, uh, taking place. And uh, we already have uh, three uh, places in place functioning, and the members who registered uh, can use uh, freely the cars, provided that they have uh, paid the membership fee. So in this way, uh, in areas where the uh, transportation uh, is not convenient, we can uh, uh, be able to use uh, car sharing with the EVs. That's one. A second is um, uh, the uh, recycling of the batteries. Uh, and uh, in there is one of the towns in the uh, disaster affected area is in town. Namie town and uh, used uh, lithium ion batteries uh, uh, are being now recycled in an uh, operating company now. EV uh, became uh, in 2010 in Japan, became in earnest in terms of the usage. So uh, the recycled reuse of the used batteries will be increasing very much going forward. In this factory of recycling, the, the, uh, there uh, is a developed technology which can measure very rapidly uh, the uh, remaining capacity of the used uh, uh, batteries. And based on that, they will be recycling and reuse of the batteries. And the third one, third initiative, is based on the viewpoint of the users and consumers. EV not being merely as a means of transportation, but uh, EV should be used as an, a fun and exciting and, uh, uh, item. Uh, for instance, and, uh, utilizing on uh, the stored uh, power in EV uh, that can uh, be used as a uh, uh, clothing uh, mo or mobile store uh, shops. And uh, there can be an, uh, a, a fitting room, uh, enough size of an adult uh, standing up. And uh, from the monitor screens, the consumers can uh, select uh, preferred items. And uh, that can be projected uh, uh, on a, a digital projector so that then the virtual fitting uh, can be available. So utilizing on, uh, and there uh, can be uh, a lot more diversity as well. <laughs> In a remote area, and the, the aged people, older people, cannot go shopping. So by u using EV, some of the frozen food uh, can be sold. So that is a project we work on. So EV can be utilized for many other purposes, not only for the vehicle transportation, but from demand side, we are able to have many trials uh, to use it for other purposes as well. Very much. Um, so. Um, with that, I, I'm going to ask, uh, open up uh, questions uh, from the audience. Uh, please uh, identify yourself and your organization. Um, uh, may I ask for a uh, show of hands? Anybody like to ask a question? Gentleman over here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Christian Hochfeld from Agora, a think tank based in Germany, and I have a question for Mr. Freeman. Um, we heard that the former Minister for Research and Science, Mr. Van Gang, also sees a great future for hydrogen and fuel cell electric cars. And uh, 
Do you think that this is um, mainly for commercial and uh, vehicles and trucks, or do you also see this in the near future as a relevant technology for uh, light-duty vehicles? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Wan Gang actually used to work in the uh, um, electric vehicle sector in Volkswagen. Um, the, the, the technology minister, uh, you know, as uh, um, China head of uh, technology, um, he always talking about future, long term, not what's going on. Um, first of all, I don't think the uh, fuel cell or hydrogen type of fuel cell will happen very quickly in my sector, the passenger car, because um, remember the the most. Uh, accessible, accessible uh, energy in the world is electricity, and people complain about charging, not convenience, and then uh, those kind of things. Uh, hydrogen, if you want to uh, build this infrastructure for the uh, storage and distribution, I would say it's probably one million times more challenge than electricity, um, and uh, it's going to be a safety issue, very expensive, and then uh, you're talking about country like China, you know, uh, uh, you cannot deliver uh, or sell a uh, passenger car to a, a customer and say you have to just go this area. No, cannot go there because we don't have a, a hydrogen uh, station. Um, but I believe in the uh, uh, public transportation, for example, city bus, uh, some sort of logistic, that's fine because you can um, easily understand or plan the, uh, the uh, routine they're going and then you can put some station around the area, although it's very expensive. So uh, in passenger car, I think the best solution for the next 20 years still, at least in China, is electricity, uh, pure electricity, very, very clear. Gentleman over here. Hello, um, my name is Felix Grohman. I represent a company called Greencom Networks, an energy IoT provider in, uh, in Europe. And Lei, I was very much agreeing with your points of us needing a fully integrated solution for, the, for these energy challenges and the climate change challenges that we have. And uh, it is crucial to have something that organizes this, uh, this system and sort of organizes all the intermittent production and loads and everything together. And um, so, so I think a lot of people agree on this, but what we find or what I find is one of the most challenging things is how to actually achieve that because you have multiple stakeholders in this. You have old school utilities, you have grid providers who are sometimes state organized entities, you have new companies like, like Envision for example who you know invests into these things, you have technology providers like us. Um, and we don't have any time. I mean we really have to, to move now. So for the last 10 years we've been sort of pushing this stuff forward. So what do you think how to make it happen in the next five years? Because we, we don't have much more time. Who's, who's going to be the one who, who actually makes it, makes it happen? Yes, uh, good, very good questions. And what I can tell you, so Envision is doing something in Germany. We are working with a few leading TSO, the great companies from Germany, from Switzerland, from Spain, from Norwegian, and also including Tenet and with a few EV companies, we are working a consortium doing the cloud balancing for grid using all the EVs. So this is, is also in the planning and implementation early stage. And uh, so from Envision experience, so far, uh, our NOS, energy op Envision and oper energy operating system now is connecting 60 million devices from a solar panel to wind turbines to HVAC EV charging stations. And what we are seeing, the synergy, which is a creating, orchestrating by the operating system is fundamental influential. And how can we achieve that in the last five years is we through the, our deep know-how, because think about this IoT is not only about digital, it's about the things. It's about machines. Our vision is to create machine social network, the intelligent machine social network. Then we start our DNA with wind turbines. So then with deep understanding of wind turbines, now our NOAs is almost cover 15 to 20% global wind turbines operating by big customer. They are, they are, they are operating on the NOAs because they believe in, in vision, have deep know-how on the digital twin of wind turbines and the solar panel. At the same time, why we can do well in the storage? 
because we invest in this battery technology, we own a battery manufacturing, then think about why Google can do well on Android, because they acquired Motorola, then they have developed deep understanding of hardware and things, then make that software is so compelling. So, I think Envision, we are a wrong investor of uh, W Motors. Yes. So, I support W Motors, so because we also want to gain the deep knowledge from EV. So, through the, think about this IoT is not only about IT network, it's about OT. It's about machine, it's about the things. So, for a company, you have to develop both sides, then you can able to accelerate this journey. Thanks. Gentlemen in, uh, in the middle there. Um. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Vince, and I'm a global shaper from the Hong Kong Hub. Um, my question is on just the assumption about uh, cars as the dominant mode of transportation. Uh, there's an increasing conversation in climate change that pushes for fewer cars in cities in general, uh, moving towards rebuilding cities and building cities uh, focused on walking, on bikes, and on mass transit, um, because manufacturing cars still creates a big uh, sort of carbon footprint. Um, so there are a lot of examples, especially look at a Amsterdam and a lot of Scandinavian cities. Um, do, you, do you guys agree with this, um, and how are you guys addressing this? Who would like to take that question? Will the, uh, will the number of electric, uh, will the number of cars, electric or not, drop inside cities? Because cities are moving to reduce the number of cars, and there's a lot more uh, new things in the mix, like uh, scooters, bicycles, uh, uh, and uh, new forms of public transportation. So um, will the demand for electric vehicle or any kind of passenger vehicle inside cities drop. I think, is that correct? Is, well, is that the right way to go, to reduce the number of passenger I so. vehicles? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, we are working with uh, Singapore government on some smart nation project, and they have big commitment to reduce the number of vehicles for next decades. And for shared transportation, for EV, all kind of facilities, okay, so some like, uh, you know, scooters, all kinds of things, is going to, to reduce the number of cars owned by people, mm -hmm. so for sure, and make city is smoother. Today, the utilization of cars is still not high enough. With AI technology, I think things are going to change. How does Renault feel about that? <laughs> yes, we, are, we have the same assumption. Yes, of course, it's not only about uh, emission, but about uh, traffic congestion. So there's no other choice than to limit the number of uh, cars and then also to improve mobility solution for, for everyone through uh, public transportation, car sharing, ride uh, hailing and so on. And it is why especially we are uh, operating in a pilot experience, uh, mainly in Europe, in, in more than 10 cities in Europe, in order for us to understand uh, those mobility solutions and to provide the the best product for this and also the best uh, services and, and, and solutions. So yes, I assume this will decrease in the big cities. And, and, but at the same time, it will be EV, much more EV. Freeman, would you like yes, to? Yes, the, the answer obviously is yes, because we, we actually already doing that. Uh, I don't know if you read the news, about two years ago, um, the Chinese New Year, during Chinese New Year, there's so many cars driving from the mainland to uh, Highland Island. And then uh, um, when the holiday stops, the seventh days of the Chinese New Year, everyone trying to drive him back. A big traffic jam, it's not hours, it's days. You know, the guys, some of the family just waiting, um, get the boat back to the mainland, days. I'm talking about traffic jam for three, four days. And then the car keep on and a lot of emission, air pollution. And so the government last year found us saying, can we do something? So uh, they are not encouraged people driving car to the island. Uh, they encourage people flying over there. Uh, we today, up to today, we put an, uh, already 1,000 electric vehicle ES5 in Highland Island. Use the apps, get and go, reserve a car, driving. The problem is Highland Island is so big. You know, you cannot take a bus from one tourist spot to another one. You have to find a way. Um, taxi is not a solution. 
driving yourself is not a good solution. Um, and obviously, uh, Highland Island, they don't like the ICE car because the pollution. So the pure electric vehicle um, and uh, sharing, putting the uh, airport would be a best solution. I would estimate, I would estimate this 1,000 years five has replaced at least 5,000 uh, normal ICE car. Um, very efficient because you are using apps to uh, utilize the, uh, the usage. It, yes, it's happening. Um, it also depend, really depends on um, the, how the government really want to do the Highland Island, they want to do that, it's happening. I don't know, Hong Kong, <laughs> maybe the Hong Kong government also want to do that. We can put a lot of uh, ES5 on Hong Kong roads. <laughs> do we have another question? The, the lady uh, here. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, Ning Hua Song, a principal partner of Arthur Delito, leading uh, automotive and manufacturing uh, practice uh, in China. I think uh, this is a great discussion. One question here is we talk a lot on the pure battery EV. Then how about the hybrid uh, plug-in, HEV, etc.? Because at the moment, um, this is, of course, EV represent a great future. But on the other hand, if you look at the current situation, and uh, you see a lot of news regarding the um, batteries went on uh, thermal out control, so the fire and then, um, and also in the north part of China, the cold, uh, when it is, uh, the temperature goes to very low, in cold temperature, the range actually is cut in half and also uh, consumers have difficulty to charge their battery EV. So, uh, so there are still breakthrough area that uh, we need in this uh, EV area. So um, I actually also worked in battery industry for, for a while. So the current issue is that uh, if we use to solve this long range issue for EV, then if we put on very heavy, big battery pack into the vehicles, then actually the, bat uh, the vehicle become very heavy then actually the energy efficiency is not high, right? And also you have safety issues, et cetera. So the current, uh, then the question is, what do you, uh, the panelist expert consider, you know, the interim solution, such as a uh, uh, plug-in and uh, battery plug-in EV or other extent range EV, et cetera. Do you think that's interim solution? Or at the end, you will have the battery EV on the road, you also have, have a plug-in, et cetera. So what's your, your view here? If I may, so just speaking from the energy perspective, uh, what you mentioned is very important. It's about the, the city. What we see, what we observe in China is that there is a strong push toward EV, both at national level and at local level. And this local municipal level is very important and it also drives what is required by the city. So under the NEV regulation, you have a number of vehicles that are tackled, whether they are battery, electrical vehicle, or plug-in hybrid, or even fuel cells. And actually, depending on the cities, some will recognize uh, as NEV, all of them, or only some of them. And I think this is a way to address your question. I mean, where uh, battery vehicles are not relevant, it is unlikely that the city will push a lot for that, and at least they will definitely include plug-in hybrid uh, I mean, EV in there. So it's, it's really a question of how is it um, not implemented but uh, applied locally depending, depending on the needs of the city. The regulation is large enough to allow uh, local specification to be taken into account. Yes, uh, for, for uh, bon, PHEV is an ideal solution because you can enjoy both, but it is costly. And I, I, I think uh, PHEV will uh, develop uh, quite a lot for next five to 10 years, but it's more uh, a transitional solution. Because if you want really good spec for PHEV, at a certain point of time, uh, the cost will be even higher than, than EV. So personally, I see this more as a transitional solution uh, for the next uh, five to 10 years. On the other side, for EV, one of our challenge as automaker is to convince the customer that it does not need a too high range, because uh, uh, 400 kilometers is more than enough. But customer wants much more, but much more is very expensive. So one of our challenges is really to decrease uh, the, the, the range of, of battery in order to make the car more affordable and it is more, more than enough for the customer, uh, basically for uh, most of the, of the usage. 
What is Envision's point of view? Because you, you believe that the cost of battery will drop anyway, right? I mean, so. So my statement, PHEV is the bridge to nowhere. <laughs> and you should spend more time on battery technology study. So the battery and the energy density is increasing day by day. Yep. And the cost of energy, battery energy, is reducing significantly. So also the safety, I'll give you some safety number. So we acquired Nissan battery business. So they providing the battery for Nissan Leaf, the biggest mo volume of car sold, EV. And zero critical incidents happened for this 450,000 cars. So you see, even the past technology can ensure the 100% safety of, of a battery. So it's about the technology. If we develop a technology further and further, we are able to make less cost, much safer, long duration. Else want to add? Obviously, I agree with uh, Mr. Zhang's, you know, the battery technology developed so quickly, you know, uh, if you leave the industry for a couple months, you'll, you'll miss what's going on there. Uh, another thing is, um, um, coincidentally, we just announced two hours ago, we're going to provide to uh, every single uh, WM Motor car owner lifetime warranty for batteries because we feel so confident, you know, there's a lot of doubt because you never use that. If you drive an electric vehicle every day, you know, the, the DAO is go out, and uh, the, the, the user experience is by far better than, especially in the speed lower than 60, per, 60 per, uh, kilometer per hour, you know, it is, it is so amazing. So try these electric vehicles, you will go, all your concerns will go away. I'd like to ask a follow-up question. Um, there's some speculation that there may be uh, uh, some scarcity issues for the uh, minerals that go into the uh, lithium and b uh, batteries. Um, is so is, to what extent do you, do you worry about that, is, or is that a concern? I think uh, if you look at the, the uh, lead acid battery for the past, and uh, if they are not do, do not do the recycle, so they are already all be used up already. So for lithium battery, so this recycle is going to be a huge business. And we have to recycle by this moral responsibility. And so there are sufficient way to do recycle well and make recycle business also very profitable. So now we, re we are even able to re recycle this garbage in Shanghai, yeah? Why you cannot recycle this such a very precious metal? It's, it's normal. Okay, thank you. Um, Freeman, would you like to add? Because uh, in our investor, we have a company like Envision. Um, they, they know the battery very well. They know how to recycle. We actually had a, a very big uh, investor. It's called Ming Metal, one of the largest mine owner, Ming, Ming mine owner in, in the world. So uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, project going on with them. First of all, according to the law in China and the law in EU, you, as a car company, you have to recycle the battery. And secondary, I agree totally with uh, Mr. Zhang. It is a good business. Uh, we, we ha uh, fortunately, unfortunately, we haven't have all any uh, battery recycled to our partner yet, but we know some of the company already doing this, very profitable, because you can recycle the battery for a logistic car purpose, for uh, the uh, electric bike, which is, had a much lower requirement compared to the, the car battery, and uh, you have the company disassembly the battery and reuse all the, uh, the metals there and then selling to the battery companies. So it's a huge business, very profitable, and uh, everyone will do that because this is a much better business than a recycle engine, you can imagine, right? Okay, thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Um, over here. Uh, so my name is Paul Ellis and I'm from an energy tech company. Uh, the, the panel briefly touched on ancillary services and grid services provided by cars and batteries. Um, does, who does the panel think is likely to win that battle for controlling what may be a very valuable service in aggregating battery services to the grid? Will it be the car companies or will it be the energy companies? I probably can answer this 
So I, on this question, I think uh, we discussed deeply in Germany uh, before our former e-raising days. One day we have an in session with we invite people from the oil executives, utility executives, CEO from energy grid, CEO from renewable energy production companies. Everyone want to claim. So we want, we want to own this charging. So car company said, okay, you know, so it's supposed to be a part of function for car. And utility company said, okay, we now we install this electric grid. And oil company said, okay, we are investing this new oil station or new electricity station. So this is going to very interesting place everyone want to get into. And I'll give you an example. This is definitely is a workable solution. We invest in a company called Zonen a few years ago. They originally is the hardware company make the battery storage. With Envision and OIS operating system, they become intelligent energy storage, able to sharing energy among users, but also to trading energy, providing grid, grid and service to tenant. So this is a, it's very similar to EV balancing because it's the battery without wheels. EV is a battery with wheels and moving around. <laughs> so I think it's for sure, but let's see what's going to happen. From my point of view, people or company who own the deep pocket, who has a deep pocket, but also has a leading IoT solution in the battle. Will NG uh, play that role? <laughs> uh, we, we don't see uh, automotive constructor or manufacturer as competitors. Uh, the idea for us is rather to see them as partners. That's the way we want to approach that challenge of uh, having the uh, EV charging more integrated in the grid. By the way, we see also the grid as a partner. It is not an easy discussion in some way, uh, especially with the grid, obviously. Uh, but definitely the idea is to work together on that. So who will win? I don't have the answer to that. And I think probably we will see emerging a number of players that are new, that are different, and that are diverse in terms of coming from the energy or automotive or why not the oil sector. Uh, but definitely automotive and energy for sure, and why not also being together? Uh, so th at least that's, that's the way we are approaching it, uh, rather than just uh, going for a fight, trying to find solution, being innovative, being constructive together. Anyone else want to add to that? Uh, we, uh, we've got time for a super quick question in the back. Hi, I'm Stefan from TWICE. We are a German-based company providing battery analytics software. And I'm very curious about currently every EV is actually powered with lithium-ion batteries. And we see the evolvement of like lithium-ion battery technology. But do you really see the next five to 10 years a very big step ahead, like a solid state or some other technologies? I think, um, you know, sometime we, we probably will have uh, some hype on the technology. So again, so uh, it's my first time using hype. Because sometimes you should, uh, but I can give you some very comparing case for solar energy. For the multi-crystal silicon, into 10 years ago, so it's about 400 US dollar per kilogram, without too much technology breakthrough, just because the fast speed of industrialization today is about close 10 to 15 US dollar per kilogram, which significantly drive down the cost of solar. So again, from my point of view, even without so-called solar state, it's going to happen probably in five to 10 years. But even for the existing lithium battery technology, A11 or whatever, with the fast industrialization on the supply chain, on the drop down of the equipment, and also the process engineering improvement and the quality ratio improvement, we are able to see 50 US dollar per kilogram, per kilo hour battery by 2025. Thank you. We, um, we are uh, out of time. I'm just 
two second sum up. I think uh, that our panelists have done a great job uh, showing us um, that uh, electric vehicles um, will only escalate, that um, they will have a big impact on climate change, that it will certainly have a huge impact on the electric grid, and that a whole combination of um, technologies such as IoT and AI will play a role in bringing this all together, um, and that uh, there will be some interesting maneuvering to see whether the new entrants or traditional companies um, end up uh, dominating um, the, uh, the sales of the vehicles, and there will be uh, an interesting battle to see who controls the uh, sector of charging um, and even the recycling of the batteries. Uh, with that, please join me in giving a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much.